especially in this city, uh, on, this, on this book at the moment. So uh, let's hear the words of God uh, and let's tune our hearts and our ears to what God has to say to us. It's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. So put away all malice and all deceit and, hypo- and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up in salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honour is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that is the, the, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and as exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That's just a prayer. Um, if you grew up in the 1990s, or you have a child who grew up in the 1990s, the name Neil Buchanan may mean something to you. Um, he presented a, a TV show called Art Attack, uh, and the idea was that Neil would kind of make arts and crafts, and then he would kind of show it to the kids. Meant to improve your art skills, it didn't improve mine one jot really, but I enjoyed the programme. But Neil uh, always ended the programme with the big art attack. And what he did was he'd kind of show the camera very closely panned in as he kind of made a little bit of dirt here, a little like kind of cardboard cut out here. And eventually the camera would pan out and it would be a big, massive piece of art. And I always enjoyed that last bit, kind of seeing that, that kind of um, big art. And tonight um, we're going to have a bit of a big art attack from Peter as he uses lots of different pictures and different images to kind of tell little stories, but also to tell the bigger story of what God wants to do with the human race. So let's have a little bit of think about where we've been. Who is writing this book? Um, if this is the Apostle Peter, um, and he was with Jesus. He's an eyewitness to Jesus. He walked with Jesus day by day. And what I love about Peter is great faith, but we also see that he's human and he's a sinner. Nothing more for me points that to than Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, um, Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? And they says, well, who, do you, uh, who do you say I am? Uh, and he says, Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And seven, yeah, go on, mate, go on, you may as well. Seven short verses later, we see um, Peter telling Jesus that, no, you're not going to die on the cross. We're, gonna, we're not going to make this happen. And Jesus turns around and he says, um, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance for me, for you are not setting the mind on things of God, but on the things of man. Just seven short verses later, and this man who was... ...into Britney Spears mode. There we go. And in between those verses... Can you still hear me now? Sound. In between those verses, in verse 18... Jesus says this, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
So the words of Peter are really important, not any more important than any other words in the, that we find in Scripture, but certainly words that we as the church need to be listening to. So I pray that you're enjoying this series, but you're listening and you're hearing and getting ready to learn what God has to say. Who is it to? Well, it's to a, a, a letter that was sent to Christians who were set a, a, around modern-day Turkey, um, predominantly to Gentile Christians, but certainly would have been some converts, Jewish converts in there. Uh, and what was important to see, as we'll see today especially, is Peter is now um, showing the God's way, God's path for um, God's future church. No longer is it just the Jewish people. It's going to be the Jewish people, the Gentile people as one body together. And that um, is so important for us. Because we know here uh, in this church, we are Christians who are in exile, spread out all over Europe. What have we seen so far? Well, in chapter 1, we're reminded of the hope that we've had, that we've been born into an inheritance that will never fade and never spoil. But we'll face trials that will, will be testing our faith as genuine. We hear the call to be holy uh, and that as we should uh, obey our Father like children. Uh, we, should try to, we should try and get rid of the things of our old ways and be holy because God is holy. And last week, um, Dave came to us and he spoke to us about um, the living and abiding word of God. So just three short points for you tonight on this next passage. Number one, be hungry. Number two, be part of his house. And number three, be in the world. Let's just pray one more time and we'll get stuck into it. Father, we uh, thank you uh, for your goodness we thank you for your faithfulness. So often our hearts are far away from you. Lord, we ask now, Lord, will you speak to us through your word and encourage our hearts this evening? Amen. So we come to this chapter, uh, and the first word should put a stop on everything we do, the word so. Because basically what Peter's saying is, everything I've said before relates to exactly what I'm going to say now. So like we've had that little recap, we need to remember to look back and take that all in context. And to kind of sum it up, we've been saved by grace. We're called to be holy like God is holy. But just flick your mind back um, just slightly to chapter 1, verse 22, 23, just to highlight these verses. Having, be, having purified your souls by the obedience to the truth from the sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. You see, Peter is talking to the church about the church. And we've had the call to be holy so we can love each other with a pure and earnest heart. So what's Peter telling us we should do? To put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Literally to throw off, to get rid of. Uh, my mind immediately rushed to uh, Hebrews 12 to throw off all the sin that so easily entangles. But it's quite a, quite, a, um, quite a wide throw that in Hebrews. But here, Peter gets very specific. These words are um, not just uh, very vague words, they're very specific words. Let's go through them one by one. Malice, the desire to cause harm. Deceit, concealing or misrepresenting the truth. Hypocrisy, Claiming to have higher standards than you have. Envy, resenting other people's life or belongings. Or slander, damaging a person's reputation. And it struck me that these are all about our words and our deeds towards each other. Um, these words that, that can so easily damage our hearts and our lives. And um, Brian kind of set me up before, but um, I'm only, only going to talk about home groups twice tonight, and then I promise I'll shut up until we start a new series in a few months' time, okay? You can forgive me for this, but in the book, uh, Love Your Church, um, the uh, author, um, in the first couple of chapters, he sets out um, the, this story where he adopted a son from Africa, uh, and the first Christmas, he took his son round to his family's house, and not just his close family was there, his wider family was there. And the son was amazed. He couldn't believe his eyes. He said, wow, are all these people my family? And the author said to him, unfortunately so. And it's the same with church sometimes, isn't it? We can feel that. That although we're one family, so often we can feel disjointed by expecting others to be better than they should be. Or we call each other down 
by our malice. Or maybe we don't quite tell the whole truth that we should be. It's so easy to sit in church, isn't it? Um, and think how these words, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, apply to other people. I don't know if you ever sat there and thought, this would be great for this person to hear. Or this would be great for that person in front of me or behind me to hear. But God's word here does not say, so help others put away all malice and then deceit. It calls us to put this away. And I know that the church in the first century was struggling with these things. I know that our hearts here will be as well. See, this side of heaven, our lives will be plagued with sin. All our good deeds, even though we think they're good, are filthy rags to God. So my challenge, first of all, is this. Which part of your life is God sanctifying you at the moment? Which part of your life do you feel God chipping away and saying, this is not of me, let's get rid of this? It may be one of those words, maybe malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, maybe slander. Could be something totally different. It's a challenge to me as I read those words. When you get the dictionary definitions of what they mean, um, they can cut to your heart. And that's a hard question for you to answer tonight. Let's read on. Because I believe the next verse will help us to know where God wants us to be. Verse 2 says this. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. So you have this image here that we are being born again into a new family. And we are infants. And what do infants need? They need this spiritual milk so that they can grow and to be more like Jesus. I want you to notice one word here, the word long. Do we long to be more like Jesus? Is it our desire? Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2 says this. As a deer pants for flowing stream, so, my, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Many of you will know that we had a new addition into our home over uh, lockdown. We had a little baby Elijah. And I can promise you, he longs for his milk. It doesn't matter what time of day or night, that boy will scream if he wants milk. That is good, isn't it? He needs to grow. He needs food so he can grow and be, um, hopefully, a functioning adult one day. Um, but is that the same for us? That picture of spiritual milk, it's a need daily. It's essential if you want to grow in Jesus. It's the walking, it's the talking, it's the basics of just knowing our Lord and our Savior. We all remember that time that we when we first came to know Jesus and the thrill of that. But so often in our lives we lose that, don't we? That kind of thrill of knowing Jesus. But God says that shouldn't stop. We should be knowing Jesus and get to know more and more each day. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about um, how he taught them with milk so that they would grow. But he also says that they weren't ready for the meat that he wanted to teach them because they were so um, lured and enticed by the world and what the world had to say. Guys, we need to be protecting our time with the Savior. It's all about having a quiet time, but we need to be protecting that time. So often in my life, I can find that I'm trying to fit the quiet time into my life, when actually I should be looking to build my life around that time with the Lord. That's another challenge for you tonight. Don't try and fit God into your life or Jesus into your life. Look to build your life around him. And this desire that we're talking about here is not something that is just purely trying harder. It's not just simply just you know, doing more or getting up and doing more. It's something that is in our hearts and we should be praying for that. One of my big prayers for our church as we come out of lockdown is that we will love Jesus more. Not just, I'm not, I don't want to say our church, I don't mean just you guys out there or people at home, for myself as well. I want to say to love Jesus more. You see, often, we only really come to long for Jesus when we come to the bottom of the barrel. When we have nowhere left to turn. And Peter knew that, didn't he himself? Peter said to the Lord Jesus, where on earth will we go? He has the words of eternal life. We should be living in that way. 
And this first section finishes off with verse 3. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Um, in, a, in my work, uh, they have a four-week rotor of the food uh, in the canteen. Now, this is big news. The kind of job I do is quite boring, so this is big news. And on a Thursday in week three, it's Cajun Chicken Day. Now, when I started, uh, I'm, I'm a bit strange, really. I don't really like hot food at lunchtime. We can talk about that later. That's probably a m- much more deep conversation to have later on about my kind of mental state with that, really. But um, Cajun Chicken with this big news. And people would talk about it, and they go, it's Thursday. Oh, it's only week one, though, so it's not Cajun Chicken. And one week, I tried Cajun Chicken. And it was amazing. It was really, really good. I tasted and saw that it was good. I've never had it since, but that's just because of my kind of hot, hot meal kind of problem. But I tasted and I knew that it was good. Uh, and the challenge here is that, um, have you tasted that the Lord is good? It's very easy to walk in this building tonight, isn't it? Uh, very welcoming people. It's very easy to sit in the pews uh, and kind of listen along and sing along with the words. But have you tasted that the Lord is good? Have you come to know Jesus as your saviour? If you haven't, please come and talk to us later. We'd love to chat to you about how wonderful Jesus is. He's a million times better than Cajun chicken, I promise you that, okay? But my other challenge on this is, when was the last time you tasted that the Lord was good? My friends get Cajun chicken every fourth, a third week on a Thursday, because they long for it and they want it. When was the last time you tasted that the Lord was good. I wonder if I was to give you 18 months, no church, work from home, no responsibilities, much slower life, would you be closer to the Lord through it? That's what we had. That's what I challenged myself with at the end of the pandemic. Was I closer to God when everything stopped? It's a good excuse, isn't it? Oh, do you know what's really busy and you know, I've got this to do, but when everything stopped, where did our hearts go? Often our hearts can be moving towards the cheap, the worthless passions that we found in chapter one of this book. But I believe that when we stop, and we taste the Lord is good, he will show himself and we will want more. And that desire won't be something we need to work on, it will just be there. And we'll know what God is teaching us. We'll know the direction of the church. We'll know what the right thing to do in this situation and we'll have more peace. Remember in chapter 1 we learned that um, they were facing troubles. It won't solve your problems, but you'll have someone to walk through the problems with you. So, that's our first point. To be hungry for the Lord, to get rid of our old ways, and to grow in Jesus. Second point tonight is this, to be part of his house. Let's remind ourselves what verses 4 to 10 say. It says this, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honour is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter starts to get out some pictures here to help us um, know what what God wants to do in our lives. Uh, And all of these images that he's going to use previously, but also in the rest of the book, uh, are Jewish Im- imagery to kind of show what God's plan is for human race. See, first here, we see the living stone. We see that Jesus is the living stone. Quite literally, that Jesus is no longer dead. He is alive, and he will be the cornerstone a little bit later on in, um, in uh, verse 6. Um, 
Peter's very good here. Um, when I was at university, um, referencing your work was really important. Otherwise, the, the tutor would throw it and say, well, that's a lot of rubbish. How do you know any of that's true? Peter references here. He shows you and say, listen, we told you what, what was going to happen. We told you who Jesus was going to be. And here is our, is our point towards it. And he references um, Isaiah 28, 16 here. Jesus is the cornerstone. In relation to architecture, a cornerstone is traditionally the first stone laid for a structure with all other stones laid in its reference. I'd love to say that that was my words, but that was often Google. But these last words here, with all other stones laid in, are laid in reference to, is so important for what we're going to find today. Because we see a beautiful picture here that Jesus is the first. But what we see next is, is that we are also living stones. We are alive, we are not dead. If we are saved by Jesus, then hallelujah, we are alive. But we are called to be laid in reference to Jesus Christ. It's not that we are saved and going to do our own thing, but we are saved to, for a purpose, to be like Jesus. And what are these stones being built into? They're being built into a spiritual house. Quite literally, the temple. Quite literally, the dwelling place of God. I want you to note here that God was not building spiritual huts or spiritual sheds. He's building one spiritual house and it goes back to what we were thinking about before about the call is for togetherness to love each other and this is my last home group show it's okay i promise um why are we doing home groups what's the point of going into people's homes to study god's word together there's lots of reasons one of the one of the big ones for us is that we will get past that shallow few weeks ago when I was um, talking about home group here, I challenged us with, th- with this question, um, what are um, people's jobs? What do they do nine to five? Where are they going to be tomorrow? Um, and I know I could not go around this church and do that for a good portion, if not all people in this room. Because our conversations are often so shallow. How can we look to get past that? It's by being built together. And so if you're not part of a home group, please uh, have a think about coming along because we'd love to have you. This image of the um, spiritual house is linked to the next image that we see. We're called uh, to be built to a holy priesthood. You remember the priests from the Old Testament? They had access to God through sacrifice. They were the ones who went in uh, on a day of atonement and they atoned for the sins of Israel. And that's the same picture here. But it's for us. We have access to God through the great high priest flick with me to hebrews chapter 4 and we're going to read verses um 14 to 16 hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 to 16 it says this listen to these words since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast to our com- uh, fast to our confession For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace uh, to help us in our time of need. That verse 16 is one of my favorite verses in all scripture. That we have confidence to approach God's throne of grace and that is only because of jesus that intimacy with god is only afforded through the great high priest so we're being built into a spiritual house where god can dwell we have access to god through jesus christ and and then the next picture here is linked again we're not there just to be still (laughs) we're not there just to be make up a number we have a role to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. And what's important to note here that is that no more death is required. Uh, Romans 12 verse 1 tells us that, uh, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, 
which is your spiritual worship. So how does that look uh, in 2021 in Liverpool? How does that spiritual worship look? Um, it's quite simply in everything, in every moment, to live a life that is holy and pleasing to God. Now, brothers, sisters, we fail at that, don't we? But we need to remember that access we have to God to go back to him and start all over again. When Sydney was here, um, he was teaching probably the, the YPF, uh, and one of the things that always stuck with me was to keep short accounts with God. Imagine your sin written up on the wall, go back to God, rip it off, and start again. Um, not only will you be thrilled by um, the love for Jesus for you and his faithfulness for you, but it will be not a stumbling block in your relationship with him. Uh, activity is good, but useless if our heart is in the wrong place. You know, we are a busy church, aren't we? A lot of things going on, which is good, but if our hearts are there for the wrong reason, it is useless. We read before, we sang before, sorry, um, unless he builds this house, the spiritual temple, we're building it in vain. Um, I've been challenged recently about um, what I do and the reasons for me doing it. Uh, which led me to write down, not just in church, but in every aspect of life, write down everything I do and challenge myself about, should I be doing that? Am I the right person to do that? Does God, that way God wants me to do that? Um, and as part of that kind of thinking, uh, I went and read M Mary and Martha's story in Luke 10. And this, these words struck me um, for my heart, um, but also for us as a church. Um, but Martha was distracted by much serving. Jesus Christ was in her house, but she didn't have the time to sit and listen. You see, like I said before, we should be finding that time and space to taste that the Lord is good. If you are too busy doing things in this church that you can't spend time with the Lord, come and find a deacon. Come and find someone, because that's not what we want. We want you to be knowing the Lord and knowing him closely so that your light and your love of Jesus can shine out in those works. It's a challenge because we do some, we've done some things here that are great works, um, but if we're not putting him first in our own personal lives, it will build to nothing. We see um, Peter again, quote two, two more verses, one from Psalm 118. And one from Isaiah chapter 8. And I think he's building on this image. Um, you think about where the, uh, the we are in church history. Um, for a lot of people, um, oh, sorry, make sure I'm on the right page. If I start, if I start talking about chapter point one again, tell me I've gone the wrong way on, on, my, on my notes, okay? Um, in first century, um, it, the, the Jewish people were for Jesus, that was an offence that he said he would be called God. Um, and for them, it was a stumbling block. Um, and you know what? There's people in churches today who are married to the religion, but not um, married to the saviour. Um, and we need to be really wary of that, especially in a church like that's been established for so long as this. If we're married to, uh, to our works or to um, being here and, and the things that we do, then we've got to do the wrong way around. We should be married to the saviour. You see, um, Jesus should be precious to us. Um, earlier on in this chapter, we see um, that Jesus is chosen and precious. Um, Spurgeon's first ever sermon as a 16-year-old was based on that verse because he believed that Jesus should be precious to us as Christians. Um, Jesus is also a stumbling block for the world, isn't he? Um, if you go in out into Green Lane town today and say that, listen, this man, Jesus, uh, he's the Lord of all, and he wants you to bow to him. That is an offense to people, that anyone could tell me how I should live. Um, and we see um, they stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. And moving on, um, G uh, Peter uh, continues with these pictures. Um, but these pictures in, in verses 9 and 10, um, they're on one theme um, about being chosen as God's people, not just for the Jews now, but for all mankind. 
we see that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and people of God's possession. We could probably do four weeks just on those four um, things there, couldn't we? Um, but that's not that's what we've been tasked with tonight, unfortunately. Um, one of the uh, commentators says this. The description of the church here is systematic and exhaustive. It's a race, and that suggests its life principle. It's a priesthood, and so has right of access to God. It is a nation, and so is under his government. And it is a possession, and so is actually indwelt by him. What we need to understand here is what joy and relief and peace this would have been for Gentile believers because they were, they were not a people. They were outside of God's kingdom. They were spread out and they were not one people. But here we hear that Jesus is pulling uh, people together to be one people. I want to read verse 10 t- together. When I was studying this chapter, um, read through over and over again and really try and pray to God. Verse 10 jumped out at me every single time. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, in our Western world, so often we we make um, God's word into kind of the British kind of version of Jesus, the British kind of word, uh, a version of, of what God's word says. I often think, and apologies, any Americans in the room or any Americans listening online, but often we look at the Americans and we go, oh, dear me. The way they, 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 they almost make Jesus into this, this American guy with his gun on his, on, his, uh, on, his, uh, on his belt and he's kind of walking around talking about the Fifth Amendment. You're like, what are you talking about, mate? But we do it in our British culture as well, don't we? We make Jesus into this kind of very easy to kind of think about person. But these words are the same for us. We are Gentiles in Liverpool today. Without Jesus, we have no home, no hope, no love. We are destined for an eternity away from him. And often we can think, oh, do you know what, but I'm British. We hear people say, don't we, oh, I'm English, so I'm a British, so I must be a Christian. That is not the case. There are so many people going to their destiny away from God because they just think, well, uh, I'm English, so I must be okay. But for us tonight, this verse here should give us so much joy and so much peace. Because once we were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but hallelujah, now you have received mercy. You are part of God's new family, saved and perfect in the eyes of God. All because of Jesus. Yeah, we are saved in our new family, built together on the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, and very quickly, uh, our third point, to be in the world. I wonder if there's been a time where you felt that you didn't fit in, where you felt like you were maybe the outsider. Um, There's many people in our churches who, uh, in our church here today, who have felt that uh, on a really kind of acute level, where maybe they've had to flee their home or flee their town uh, because of what they believe in Jesus. But often, we can feel it just in our day-to-day life, can't we? We, send, we step into a room and think, I don't quite fit in here. And that's the kind of theme we're getting. Um, but I want to focus on these two words that we see in, in verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and as exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Sojourners and exiles. Um, I love this picture because I think um, it really paints a nice picture. Um, to live in a place temporarily but to be dependent on its hosts okay to live in a place temporarily but to be dependent on its hosts you see we know that this is not our destination isn't it or at least we hope we do um, as i've got older uh, and I, had, I am older i promise than i used to be um, i can feel that more and more feel more and more out of place in the world as I see the evil that's going on, I see the way the world is going on, so many issues, I just feel alien to that. But I'm dependent on this world. I need to move around this world, I need to be in the world. God's call here is not to live in our own Christian bubble in this room, it's to go out and be in that world, and we'll find out a little bit more why that is in a moment. But also, this word exiles, 
a few times Peter's going to use the word exiles and I think um, one of the things it links back to uh, is back to Daniel uh, and about how they were exiles in Babylon uh, what's the story there Daniel taken away from Israel put in Babylon and is forced to live the Babylonian way his name is changed his diet is changed he's told to bow to idols the culture pressures in on him to change and these images here call us to, to um, live a holy life um, but not, not the one that bows to this pressure. You know, as I was thinking about this, uh, in my lifetime, born in 1989, right up to today, um, we've seen culture step away from God and kind of say, that's fine for you, I'm going to go do this. And I think what we're seeing now is the culture is pushing back. That we're now finding that the culture says, no, um, that's not fine what you do anymore. We're going to kind of uh, want a piece of that and push back. And that is going to be a challenge. Pray for younger Christians. Pray for those next generations to come. Because the pressure is going to get higher and higher and higher. And I know, and I'm sure you know as well, that our sinful heart can so often be lured away by the world's pleasures and by its means. It's very subtle. Even in our apps on our phones, our world is telling us the way we should be living. And this is why it's so important that we spend time with God every single day. And why is that the case? Because we find out next. To abstain from the passions of the flesh. It's inbuilt in my heart um, and we need to be aware of this. Uh, and next this, um, we need to be waging war against this. This is not timid language, is it? To wage war um, against this way. Or, or what I should say properly is that this world wants to wage war against our souls. Um, I was going to uh, go and kind of dip my toe into Ephesians here, into the armour of God, but I know Steve's going to get that covered and he'll do a much better job than I will in a few weeks' time. But that's the image, isn't it? The armour of God. What have we got to fight against the fiery um, arrows of the devil? I'll come back in a few weeks and Steve will tell you from, from uh, the armour of God. Um, but if we're saved here tonight, they might say to me, well, why does it matter? Why does it matter how I live if I know that um, Jesus has saved me? Well, let's find out. Let's read verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. You see, we need to make sure that our conduct amongst those who are not saved is honourable to God. For what purpose? Not that we come across like good guys or, or, or good um, ladies, but that we will glorify God, that ultimately he will get all of the glory. Um, I know a few people in, in my work who will say that they go to church. Um, they won't call themselves Christian, but they say they go to church. But I know I can see in their lives that it does not reflect um, Jesus Christ. Not to say they're not saved, obviously I have no right to say that, but certainly their life does not reflect that. So does your life do that? As you rub shoulders in the world as we're called to be, does your life shine Jesus? You see, um, we want people to come and know our Father. As we said before, taste and, s taste and see that the Lord is good and then tell others about it. People are telling you know, come to all the hay, it's all the talk, I promise you, cake and chicken, I promise. But it's that thing, isn't it? It tastes good. We should be showing in our lives and in our words. But I want to just focus on these words here. Um, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. In the first uh, century church, they had um, things slung at them as evildoers. A few examples. They were called cannibals because they heard they were eating the body of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ. They were called, uh, they, 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 were, they would hear or they were told that um, the brothers and sisters would be marrying, but what was happening was brothers and sisters in Christ were marrying. Agape feasts were told to be wild orgies and they were called antisocial. They did not um, uh, partake in the immoral uh, entertainment of the day. A little bit later on in this book, we'll, we'll see um, 1 Peter 4 verse 4 says this, 
with respect to, to this, uh, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. You see, the exiles in Peter's day, they follow God and they stuck out like sore thumbs. The people said, you know, the stuff you're doing sounds pretty strange, sounds pretty bad actually. Uh, and But, you know, come and join us in this, come and do this with us, come and follow our ways. But they didn't. And they will be maligned, they will be pushed back against, they'll be mistreated. And I'm sure uh, you have found in your life, in your times here, uh, as you have stepped back, you may have been called those words, antisocial. Um, I know my time uh, as, as a Christian where um, maybe friends in work or friends in university would go out um, and I'd have to draw a very strong line about where I went or what I didn't do or what I didn't say. Um, because um, I believe that God's word is right and I should follow that. I've been very fortunate in my life to only have a few comments flung my way, but some people in our world are killed for this. The world's view on sex and gender and identity is becoming more and more prescient upon us. And as we stand on God's truth, we will be thrown under the bus. We will be called evil, bigoted. And we need to be standing on God's truth. Why? Because we need to show that God's way is the truth. We need to show that what we believe is what we follow. Nothing worse is than someone saying, I, I believe this and doing something totally separate. It's just so, well, Jesus must mean nothing to you then. We need to be making sure our lives are honourable out in the world for the one purpose, that they may see our good deeds and glorify God in the day he visits us. We need to be out so the world can see us living for Christ. So, who are your non-Christian friends, colleagues, neighbours that you are living out um, God's loving. Caleb Elliott was here a few uh, Sundays ago, wasn't in the morning, he said he joined a football team for that purpose. He was being uh, really kind of um, kind of forthright with that. But you will meet people tomorrow who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be making sure our, our lives are full of Jesus so that we can be uh, following him. Our time is up, so let's just sum up what we've learned in God's word tonight. To be born again and to grow like Jesus, to be continually tasting that the Lord is good. We've learned of our new position in God's new kingdom, that we are that Jesus is precious and we are laid in reference to him. And we are built into a spiritual temple where God can dwell, built on the cornerstone of Christ Jesus. And we are called to live in the world as witnesses to God's testimony, for God's glory. Let's uh, pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we know tonight that our hearts so often can be um, far from you. Lord, I ask, Lord, will you help us to have hearts that throw away uh, the sin that so easily entangles and Lord, place it with a, uh, replace it with a desire to know you more. And Lord, as we are built together as a spiritual temple for you here in this local church and in the wider global church, Father, I pray, Lord, that we'll be built in reference to you. And Lord, that you will build people to be like you here at Bethel. And Lord, as we go out and live in the world, Lord, remind us of that verse tomorrow, Lord, as we step out into the world, Lord, to be uh, just your, your love and your light. And we thank you, Lord, for your time with us this evening. Lord, we thank you for your, your word. And Lord, will it go ringing out in our ears tonight. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Let's sing Cornerstone.